December 21st, 2012 is likely to be right around the start of the next solar maximum. So the sun goes through 11 year cycles, minimum to minimum, maximum to maximum. And by ast ast astronomers consensus, we're looking at um, a maximum beginning end of 2012 and carrying on through most of 2013. So December 21st, 2012, certainly it's at the beginning of the red zone. What does solar maximum mean? It means that there are more storms on the sun of greater, greater frequency and ferocity than, than normal. And sometimes these storms explode with what are called coronal mass ejections, which billow out in all directions and occasionally hit the earth. When these CMEs or uh, coronal mass ejections are big enough, it can cause real problems here on Earth, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit later on. I'm going to get right, cut right to the chase. If there's one bit of understanding that I wish er, any, anyone who's watching this interview to take away, it's this. In 1859, there was a major solar blast called the Carrington event, which was spectacular but not particularly disruptive. The, the aurora danced all the way down to the equators. The telegraph system was overloaded and some, some offices burst into flames. Ships were thrown off course. But in general, it was more of a natural wonder than it was a disaster or catastrophe. That was a, just, a, just a major solar blast, the largest one in recorded history, but we've only been recording them since then. So 1859, 150 years or so. If we get hit by one of those today, the same magnitude as the Carrington event of 1859, or other storms that hit in 1909 or 1921, that will knock out the electrical power grid for months or years. This is not just according to me, this is according to the National Academy of Sciences, which is no fringe organization. Their, uh, their report on severe space weather, which came out in December 2008, clearly details that we could be without electricity, up to 130 million Americans could be without electricity for months or years. And no electricity doesn't just mean no telecom. It means, in many cases, little or no water or fuel because the pumps are electric. No refrigeration. Um, basically, minimal banking, law enforcement, and military security. Would it be like being thrown back into a pre-electric society? No, it would be much worse because the folks in the, who lived before electricity was part of society knew how to live without it. We don't. It's the paradox of progress that we're looking at. You become dependent upon your innovation, and we are totally dependent upon electricity. There's air, there's water, there's food, and there's electricity. And we cannot, we are not in any shape to go for months or years without it. Um, this problem, this potential threat is so dire that in 2010, the United States House of Representatives voted unanimously to take steps to protect the power grid from, from these solar blasts. Look, those folks won't cross sail to perform the Heimlich maneuver, and yet the Republicans and Democrats were unanimous in, in their support for taking steps to protect the grid. I'll explain how, the, how to do it in, in a bit. But in its inimitable wisdom, the Senate committee in charge of, of this, the corresponding legisl legislation stripped out all language pertaining to the power grid because the utility industry leaned on them not to be regulated. So we have the odd circumstance where Republicans and Democrats united to a man and to a woman to protect the, the electricity, electricity that suckles our civilization. And the Senate, because of bent to, the Senate committee bent to arcane and frankly, what I consider evil special interests to scuttle the bill. And we're nowhere. And we're, we're heading into the red zone. The next red zone of solar blasts and solar storms, as I mentioned, beginning probably right around December Late, to, late 2012, probably December 21st, is as good a date as any to, to say. So we're heading into the storm, we had a chance to protect ourselves, and we blew it. How do you protect yourself against solar storms? Where do you put up a big umbrella? No. What you do, it's, it's so simple that it makes me almost sad. I never thought my, my career as a writer, and I've been writing for 30 years now, would add up to surge suppressors. It doesn't have that romantic culmination feeling to it. But surge suppressors, just the way that you plug in your computer or your plasma TV to um, protect it from electrical surges, that's what we need to do to the power grid. Look, may I explain how this, this whole thing works? Yeah. Okay, there's a storm on the sun. If it's big enough, 
an explosion issues from, from the sun, and if it comes from the northwest quadrant of the sun's face, it frequently hits the earth. Usually what happens is the storm, storm of the sun hits the earth and the incoming radiation is channeled round and round by the, what are known as the Van Allen radiation belts. Mm. But occasionally the, the, the blast is big enough to, to penetrate inside the belt and come to the surface. The electricity goes into the ground, then pops up back out and fries the transformers. So the transformers are the nodal points of the grid. We have in the North American grid about 350 of the largest transformers, which um, have proved susceptible to um, these blasts. And it's not just that they, they are broken, their copper windings are fused solid. So the idea would be to, to put a, a surge suppressor, here's the ground, here's a transformer, put a surge suppressor in between. So in case there's a surge, the surge suppressor can, can nullify it and the transformer is safe. What happens if a transformer is, is, is hurt in this way? Well, the biggest transformers weigh over 100 tons and there's a three-year waiting list on the world market for these things. So you can't just you know, stick in another one. You can't just dispatch a utility crew to fix it. Also, the United States no longer produces trans the largest caliber of transformers, so we'd be dependent on Brazil, India, and China to supply us in a timely fashion. They are not enemies. It is not right, I don't think, to look at them as such. But they, their interests, they will put their own interests above ours, I'm sure. Um, it's, it's estimated that to protect the power grid, to take these 350 major transformers and protect them from solar blasts, it would cost between half a billion and a billion and a half dollars. Money. Expensive. But barely 1%, for example, of the AIG bailout. Not so much money when you consider it's an insurance policy to protect the electricity that we all depend on. This is profoundly important. And if we don't take advantage of the opportunity that we have right now to at least begin protecting our power grid, we're going to get hit. Storm of the caliber of 1859, 1909, 1921, you know that it's going to happen again. The sun, you know, it's, it's just a matter of time. And every year that we wait, we become more and more dependent upon electricity. We become more and more dependent upon our devices and our technology. And less able to recover in a timely fashion. Worse is the, it's, the United States is not the only nation that would be affected. However, we are among those most exposed because we run our transformers at very high levels and we're near the pole. Nations near the pole where the Earth's mag protective magnetic field is the weakest, are most susceptible. In 1989, we had a small such solar blast that knocked out the, the transformers and the, the utility Hydro-Quebec in Canada. Nine million people went, went without electricity, most for hours, some for weeks. Uh, in New Jersey, um, uh, a nuclear power plant was shut down because the transformer blew. There was a $36 million loss there. In 2003, as it happens on Halloween 2003, Another storm hit and knocked out 14 transformers in South Africa, knocked out their grid. And it took them years to recover. You know, we say, well, South Africa, they always got problems. We tend to be dismissive. But there's a lot we could have learned from that. Um, I attended a, a 19 Nations Summit Conference at Parliament in London about this, where, uh, how do I put this? I was... We all were, were required to sign a pledge that we wouldn't disclose what, what occurred at the, at the conference. So really, all, all I can say is pray. I do note that a year later, the United Kingdom has come out with a comprehensive plan to protect its power grid from, from solar storms. We have nothing of the sort. Uh, I, as I understand it, Israel has, has also taken steps uh, to do so. So this is being taken very seriously in other parts of the world. Russia too? Russia and China were not invited to this c conference, which um, can lead to all sorts of speculation. Um, Russia doesn't run its transformers quite as high capacity. China runs some of its transformers at a million volts. Ours, are the, the most that we run are 750,000 volts or 750 kV. China runs some at a million, so they are vulnerable. They're a little bit further down in the latitudes, and we are a little bit farther away, therefore, from the poles. So. Perhaps they're somewhat less vulnerable. It's hard to say, but they're they're definitely still within in, 
in the possibility of losing it all. And I've really, I would love to speak on the subject in China because I think that they're, they're expanding their grid so rapidly that uh, it's much easier to protect the grid as you build it than it is to go back and retrofit it. So they have a great opportunity. But this is important, particularly because the Earth's magnetic field is apparently weakening. And you say, okay, you know, says who? There's been a lot of loose talk about a pole shift, and that is where the, the north, north and south poles, they don't physically move around geographically, but their polarity, their, their magnetic orientation shifts. And we may or may not be in the middle of a pole shift. Uh, such, a, such a shift apparently occurs every 780,000 years or so. That number may be revised. But, and it takes a couple of thousand years to complete. And during the time of the pole shift, the whole Earth's magnetic field becomes weaker. And multiple poles spring up. So you don't have just north and south. You have a northeast and a southwest. And it's quite confusing to uh, animals that depend on um, the magnetic field for as though it were an internal GPS system. GPS. But one very vivid illustration of, of how our magnetic field is faring occurred in December 15th, 2008. When a squadron called Themis... T-H-E-M-I-S, a squadron of five NASA solar research satellites, flew unexpectedly through a giant pole-to-equator breach hole gap in the Earth's magnetic field. All of a sudden, the five satellites reported the same finding that the, the, the magnetic field density went down to 10% of what it, had, what it had been and what it was expected to be. And from pole to equator, and this is way far out, so this is the, the size of the, the hole was much larger than the Earth itself. The NASA, uh, the lead scientist on the NASA, pro NASA project, uh, a man named Dave Drybeck, exclaimed it was so surprising what they found that it was as though the sun rose in the west. This finding was, was that shocking. So, we have a gigantic hole opening in the Earth's protective magnetic field. The shields are down, Scotty. And we've got, we're moving towards the red zone of, of sunstorms, beginning late December 2012 and continuing on through 2013. We've got a National Academy of Sciences report backed up now by numerous other studies, including those that were sponsored by Oak Ridge National Laboratories, NASA, and again, the, uh, a summit at Parliament in London agreeing with this finding. So we are headed towards the greatest threat to our power grid and really to our way of life that we've ever faced. And no one really seems to be taking this very seriously. Well, no, I take that back. America. <laughs> yeah, the United States is not taking this very seriously. 